Engaging Difficulty in the Composition Classroom, uh, featuring one of our fabulous authors, Stacey Waite. Uh, on the call with me today is, of course, Stacey, who I'll introduce in just a moment. My colleague, Jillian Daniels, is someone that you'll be hearing from probably in the chat box if you've been asking any questions about registration or logging in. Uh, my colleague, John Sullivan, is also on the line, and he's an editor who works very closely with Stacey. So uh, I apologize for a little background noise, but I uh, want to welcome you all. and. Uh, I'll transition over here to Stacy, and just to mention a few things about the webinar. At any time, you can send your questions to us in either the Q&A window or the chat window. Those typically appear on the right-hand side of your screen. And uh, Stacy will also pause periodically for questions. So, uh, about a little bit about Stacy here. Uh, she is assistant professor of English at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where she teaches courses in composition and rhetoric and in gender studies. Stacey has published articles and essays on the teaching of writing in numerous journals and anthologies, including Writing on the Edge, The Feminist Teacher, and Reader, Essays in Reader-Oriented Theory, Criticism, and Pedagogy. Stacey was a co-editor of the Best of the Independence Rhetoric and Composition Journals 2011, uh, 2011 and she's worked in West, the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and currently the Nebraska Writing Project. There's a lot more wonderful things we could say about Stacey, but I think we'll start here. And again, welcome everyone, and Stacey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, hold on, I'm already having a problem with my slides all of a sudden. There we go. Um, I'm really um, happy to be here and happy to be um, talking about this subject. Um, I think one of my favorite subjects uh, in, the, in, in all of composition. And so um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'll just say that when I'm giving examples today, I'll be talking uh, about some examples that come from uh, Ways of Reading, the textbook um, that I edited with David Bartholomew and Anthony Petrosky. But um, I do think that all the examples and things I'm going to um, talk about will kind of be um, applicable to um, any sort of any sort of composition classroom. And so um, I wanted to start with a sort of basic question um, about uh, why difficulty. And this is, of course, a question you hear <clears throat> students ask about, you know, maybe like very dense theory tests all the time, like does this really need to be so hard? And so I want to make a little bit of a case about um, why I think uh, first year writing should be hard, why it needs to be hard. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I want to talk about is the value of contradiction. I just want to talk a little bit about what I mean by that. I'm sure um, many of you can remember, and I can remember being in, in, in middle school when I started, I guess, writing more complicated essays, and having teachers maybe circle moments where you're contradicting yourself. And the implication of that was that contradicting yourself was a bad thing and you should stop doing that. So as a writing student, I remember I used to just delete one of those moments, right? So I can get rid of the contradiction by just taking one of these sentences out and leaving this other one in. So I just make, need to make up my mind. Do I feel this way or that way? Um, and I want to push on the idea that those contradictions are precisely where, uh, where the essay is or where the student should go rather than the moment they should fix. And of course, I have this quote here from F. Scott Fitzgerald that goes, uh, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And so <clears throat> one of the sort of answers then to why difficulty is because um, students need to be able to think in more complex, less binary ways. They need to be able to think two thoughts at the same time. You know, if we're going to, you know, even if you think about um, writing teachers that might use, you know, controversial subjects to get students to write about, um, we don't want to read an essay that's just all pro the death penalty or all anti the death penalty, where the student goes and just looks for evidence about something they already think, but we'd want them to sort of chase the contradictory nature of their own opinions, because obviously all of our opinions about many of these subjects contain those kinds of contradictions. And so that's the the first reason I think you know why why difficulty. Um, the second um, has specifically to do with the way ways of reading is designed, but I know also has to do with the way a lot of a lot of composition instructors design their courses which is the value of students sort of building their own projects. Um, uh, in ways of reading, we have lots of what we call sequences, right, that one could use in a whole course. One is on the aims of education. One is on exploring identity <clears throat> and the self. Um, we have, you know, m many others. But this idea is that students can get involved in the intellectual activity of exploring the aims of education um, in, in highly philosophical and interesting ways. They've all been students. Um, I think it's really interesting to have, you know, students read, say, um, Richard Miller, who's in the anthology here, and there are moments where he talks about college writers and, you know, to ask students to think about 
you know, hey, composition is, is not just a class you take, but it's a field where people talk about you. Like, this is the kinds of things they say. What do you think? Um, so I think, you know, getting students engaged in their own sort of independent project building. And I think sometimes people think that means not writing assignments or not assigning text, like letting the students write the assignments or pick the books, and, um, which I think can have its own set of um, interesting outcomes. But I think it's more about teaching them how to find their independent, independent projects in the confines of what they're doing. I mean, if you think about moving through the world or being a writer in the world, basically figuring out how to move in your own way in a, struct in a structure or field of constraints is basically every moment of our lives, right? Um, <clears throat> next thing, of course, is the, the value of error. I'm sure many of you are familiar with work that talks about, you know, students making Shaughnessy, people like that, st students making errors. Um, the more complicated thoughts they have, both grammatical errors and also sort of any other way we might think about errors or failures or misreadings that students might engage because they're engaged with something difficult. And so similar to that move in the contradictions, you know, one of the things I like to think about is how to engage um, the error, the misreading, the failure as an intellectually interesting place to go as opposed to a place that needs to be fixed. Um, this last one, um, I call the value of struggling or grappling, and I guess I talk about this in two ways. Um, one is the idea of grappling with the text, right, like struggling to access it. Like, What is it, you know, a first-year writer reading Foucault, there's a struggle to access. Like, what is being said here, right? So um, I think there's a value in that, especially if we think about first-year writing in relationship to what students have to do every time they move disciplines in, in any, um, any college setting, right? They have to sort of learn to access the texts. Um, and so that's different when you're trying to read Shakespeare's sonnets. That's different when you're trying to read Descartes. That's different when you're trying to read Foucault. How to access those texts is different. I think you know, students don't necessarily know that yet. Um, they know that all those texts are hard. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then the second thing um, I want to talk about in terms of the value of grappling is um, the value of struggling with question raising. So um, you know, we see a lot of um, people talking in really smart ways right now, like, um, you know, uh, there's Gerald Graff's uh, and Kathy Bergenstein's say, say, I say, right? And trying to, like, help students see, like, okay, these intellectual moves, how do people make them? I might say that one of the things that's sort of missing from that discussion is teaching students to ask, to raise complicated questions rather than how to construct complicated arguments, which, is, of course, is another skill. Um, I'm more interested in, and I think uh, ways of reading is sometimes more interested in, like, what does it mean to raise a complicated question about a subject or a text? And um, I want to share just quickly a, an exercise um, with you that I use a lot. You can take an object, and you can do this with anything. I often do it with a water bottle. I sort of pass it around your classroom, and, and uh, each student has to stop and ask a question about, about, the, about the object. So let's take, for example, the water bottle. Then the students would have to say, um, you know, okay, what color is the label, or where, where is this recyclable for five cents, or like questions like that. Those questions are going to be questions we can find the answer to. Um, they're sort of one-dimensional questions. But then, as you keep going around the room, and you can do this for a long time, the students have to think about more creative or complicated questions, like, what happens to this when it, when it is recycled? Um, where does it go? Um, uh, what, why do we, in this culture, drink bottled water when there's nothing wrong with water? <laughs> you know, like questions like that that can kind of get to larger questions of sort of capitalism, consumption, marketing, um, those types of questions that can get sort of complicated. And so really helping students to see the difference between a question that can be answered that one doesn't need to grapple with or struggle with and a question that um, is really complicated that one could sustain for, for quite some time. So <clears throat> um, I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of difficulty in ways of reading and also by implication the kinds of difficulty that I think are sort of necessary for the teaching of first writing, um, the first year writing. The first, the first I, I break them into reading and writing categories, but that's really fake because obviously they're not separate. But just sort of for the purposes of us, you know, sort of going through them, I kind of broke them up. The first is that density and length um, is actually important. And that's, um, if, you've, if you've ever looked through ways of reading, you know students are reading excerpts from Foucault, uh, you know, from Appia, from people, from Butler, you know, people who are reading, writing long and, and dense texts. Um, and I guess one of the values of this um, is to also talk with students about the static we all experience when we're reading. Um, probably the most successful time I ever had teaching first year writing was the first time I ever taught it. And it was because I was teaching um, Foucault from Ways of Reading and I had never 
even read that text before until I had to teach it. And so my students and I going through the text and struggling with it together and both you know, having that static, not understanding every line, like that actually created a really good dynamic in, uh, in terms of making a sort of collaborative environment where we are sort of co-investigators in this sort of struggle, right? And that they could see that like almost no one picks up Foucault and is like, oh yeah, I'm just going to kick back and like just let this absorb into my brain. Like we all have to work on the text to do it, right? The second kind of difficulty I think is important is the subject matter. And so what kinds of difficult subjects are we talking about? And by difficult subject, you know, I mean things like identity, education, history, philosophy, sexuality, you know, that I want to engage students in the sort of intellectual questions um, of our time. And so, you know, talking about these kinds of subjects um, and subjects that are difficult and that can cause many other kinds of difficulties in the classroom, I think is really crucial. So you'd find if you look through ways of reading that most of the texts, um, I would say all of them actually, probably um, are really raising those questions about difficult subject matter. <clears throat> Developing new reading strategies, I think, is a, a really important one. So students are usually familiar, at least in my experience from high school, with this idea of annotating. Um, so they, they highlight, they annotate. But I actually don't think sometimes that those strategies help students really understand the sort of meta level of like, what do you do when you read? Like, what do they do? What kind of thinking moves do they make? Or what kind of, you know, I call them like habits of mind do they engage while they're reading? And so one of the things I try to do with students is to help them think about like, what do you do when you read? Not just like, what do you highlight or what do you write down, but like, what do you do with stuff? Um, how do you, when you react to something, do you do anything with that reaction? How do you... How do you become someone that can read a text to write? Like you, you, you need to do something with the text other than just, I'm sure you've all had this happen too, or a student comes in, they've, they've highlighted you know, every other paragraph of the whole text, but it doesn't tell any story about what they do when they read. And so really teaching students to think about like how can you tell the story of this, of this reading? Um, so in terms of writing, um, one of the things I think is really important is, is prompts that sort of invite students to read them also. So meaning if you've seen any of the prompts and ways of reading, the prompts themselves are also difficult, right? So working with students to try to find an entry point, like how to get, how to get into that prompt as a way to get into that text. Um, and then, of course, what it means to engage with a text or an idea, right? So students are familiar with using a text as evidence, right? I'm using this text here. Um, to show that the thing I just said is true. But really, um, at least in the essays I most love, and I think probably most of us, um, usually you just use text to do way more complicated things. So like citing another text is not about evidence 90% of the time. Um, it's about this idea of like engaging with the text, engaging with its language, right? And really sort of illuminating that um, for students is important when they're also thinking about a difficult text, right? So those are kind of the... I guess the introductory remarks I want to make about um, about the, the sort of overview of the subject, and I'm going to kind of go into some strategies and some um, assignments that might help illuminate those strategies sort of as we move through. But I'll I'll stop there just just for a minute to see if there are any questions um, so far about um, anything I've said thus far, and um, I can't see the questions, so someone would have to tell me what they are. Uh, yes, if the attendees have any questions. Uh, uh, this is Jillian, by the way. Uh, please go ahead and uh, submit them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. No pressure, uh, but if you have um, any questions, maybe any statements uh, from in response to what you, uh, we've covered so far, please go ahead and enter that. Um, I don't see anything coming up. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, so one thing I think is really, um, really great about ways of reading, and I would encourage anyone to do this in, in any classroom, really, is to, I mean, the introduction to this particular textbook is, for me, crucial. Every time I've taught it, I, I use the introduction itself. And I would recommend if you don't teach the book but you use other texts, anytime you can have students read about reading <laughs> before they do it, um, I think is really important. Um, and so <clears throat> um, I'm going to sort of read a little bit um, uh, of from some assignments that I, I've given with the introduction that kind of highlight the way to um, show students, um, you know, how the how the reading process is going to work and how they're going to engage with these texts. So. Um, 
So you could use the introduction to ways of reading. Um, there's a text I'll mention later in the presentation called How to Read Write a Writer, How to Read Like a Writer by Mike Bunn. Um, there's tons of stuff out there, um, not just the introduction to this textbook, but I do like the way um, this textbook kind of deals with this question. So <laughs> you can see um, on the slide here, it says, as you read the introduction to ways of reading, or any text about reading, mark passages that seem striking to you in some way, um, and choose two of the passages that seem uh, meaningful. And so then I ask them, once they've chose those passages, to um, think about what the passages mean, how they're connected to one another, um, how does each of the passages reflect, challenge, or speak to your prior experiences of reading and writing? So that's crucial um, for me to have conversations with my students about their prior experiences of reading and writing. Um, how, And not just did they like it, did they do it, um, but when they did do it, how? Um, what do they do when they read? Um, I ask them to think about what the, what the introduction is asking them to do, um, how they respond to that asking. And then, uh, what kind of reader have you been in your life thus far? And again, I don't just mean like good reader, bad reader, or frequent reader, or infrequent reader, but thinking about these ideas of what do you do when you read? What, what have been your purposes when you read? What do you read for? Um, have been crucial questions for me. Um, and then I ask, you know, how does this introduction ask you to be a different kind of reader um, than you have been before? And so um, I think <laughs> this is this is a way that you can get students to sort of start to have a discussion about the challenges of reading. And I mean both the sort of, I don't know, we could call them surface level challenges, like the idea that you start reading a page and then your mind sort of drifts. Like, what do we do with that? Um, and I think what students think is that professors don't have that or instructors don't have that. Um, only they have that. So there's like some kind of failure in them that they sort of find themselves daydreaming on the third page or their mind wanders or they, they did read a paragraph but it just didn't go in, right? Um, and I think it's really useful for teachers and students to kind of get on the same page that that's part of reading um, and that the more you figure out what strategies you can use, maybe the less that will happen to you, but still it will happen to you, right? If you have a living, breathing imagination, um, it will kind of continue to happen. And so I think that moment where, you know, the teachers and students can kind of be together with that struggle is super important, as opposed to the students are struggling and the teacher is sort of standing there watching the struggle, but that the student, the teacher is also kind of like engaging in the struggle. Like, this is hard. It doesn't matter who you are reading Judith Butler. I mean, even if you're Judith Butler, reading Judith Butler is not going to be like, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to pay attention um, or, or you won't know what's going on. So um, I want to share one more, uh, one more uh, activity dealing specifically with reading that I think is important. Um, so um, I'm going to read quickly from a, from the introduction of Ways of Reading, just to kind of give you, it, it has this metaphor if you're not familiar with it, this idea of reading with and against the grain. So I want to um, read a little bit uh, of section just quickly. It says, uh, reading with and against the grain is one way to think about the work of reading. And even within this metaphor, there are more than two ways of reading. But we might also extend the work of the metaphor. Our students have explored this metaphor and have even come up with metaphors of their own for thinking about what reading is and what it means to do a reading. One student described reading um, as much like walking uh, to the grocery store. One could take a direct route, focusing on the ultimate goal, perhaps making a list of items as he walked. One could also meander, not worrying about time or what, it, what he needs to pur purchase, but thinking again about, uh, instead about the sunset or about traffic patterns. Readers can be, in many ways, like walkers, sometimes focused and clear on their goals, sometimes allowing their minds to wander or notice something other than getting to the grocery store, sometimes ending up in places they didn't think they were going. Um, and you know, so, so you see on this slide this idea of working with students for metaphors, and I like to ask them to come up with metaphors of their own. Like, what's it like? What's it similar to when you when you read? What is it like when you read? So that they can begin to sort of really think through those metaphors, right? And I love that example of thinking about going to the grocery store, right? Sometimes we go with this, like, I need this, this, and this, and I need to get out of there, you know? And I think, you know, being honest with students, that there are reading situations that call for that kind of reading. I need this information. I need to go in and get it and then get out of there. Um, that's a different kind of reading than, say, I'm going to go in here and just kind of see, I don't know, maybe – Maybe I'm going to see what I feel like making for dinner, or I'm going to go in here. I know I have sugar in my cabinet at home. I'm going to see what else I can do using that sugar, right? Like that there's all these different approaches that we could take to shopping, and it's the same way with reading, that like you're looking to do something when you do it, right? So if you're looking to write something after you read, you know, what kinds of things would you be doing um, when you're reading as opposed to 
uh, if you're just looking to read because um, it's fun or because it's entertainment or, you know, other reasons. So that's been really productive for me and for my students to talk about those kinds of um, metaphors as they, as they work. Um, so I mentioned earlier this idea of um, reading through prompts with students. Um, and I don't mean just like this idea of like going over the assignment. Of course, like many people go over the assignment. But I mean sort of unfolding and unpacking the logic of the assignment. So um, what I'll usually do with ways of reading is I'll take one of the, we have some shorter readings in the text, like an essay by Brian Doyle that's only two pages long. Um, I might go to that section so that we can all read the essay together and then read the questions and move through the questions in the book. Um, and for me, this question of what kind of work do these questions seem to want you to do is really important because then we get to questions about why. Why would it want you to do that? Why would that be worthwhile to do? Um, right? I think it's crucial, especially now, I'm sure all of us are likely working in departments where the English majors are decreasing and um, people are, you know, economically being sort of sent in other directions. Um, and I think sometimes that's because we don't make clear what the kind of work we do, like how it matters in the world. And so I think even looking at a prompt and saying, like, why would someone want to do this? Like, why would you want to think about this? Why would you want to do this assignment? Why would you want to do this exercise? What good could come of it? What does it have to do with anything else in the whole world? And I also think it's illuminating for us in terms of the assignments we write, because if the answer to that is like, I don't know what it has to do with anything else in the whole world, then it's like, okay, that assignment stinks. You know, like, so um, I think that really being explicit about what, are you, what kind of work are you about to do um, with this prompt and, and why, why do it, um, for, what, for what purpose, it's been really crucial for me. Um, so, I think um, one of the things that really helps with difficult texts and with helping students kind of think about how to approach them is this idea of um, what I call reading rhetorically, what other people like Mike Bunn, who I've listed here, have called reading like a writer. Um, I also talk about it as the difference between what does it say and what does it do. So students are very familiar with what does it say, right? That's on the ACTs, that's on the SATs. That's every test they've ever taken uh, after they've read something, right? What did it say? What does it say? What does the text say? Um, they spend a lot less time talking about what the text does. What does it do? How does it move? Um, those types of things. Um, and they talk, they, they often talk, I mean, they talk about structure maybe or organization, but they don't necessarily talk about that as what a text is doing, right? So to me, that's a really crucial um, conversation to have in, in first year writing um, with students who are kind of trying to get, get a hold on kind of difficult text. So I have this uh, um, second bullet point here that says read like a sports announcer. And this is just an example I use to help illuminate. Um, and I can actually give you an example um, from that short Brian Doyle essay I was I was referencing earlier. So I'm going to read you the first um, couple sentences, and then I'm going to I'm going to show you what I mean by read like a sports announcer. So here's the first couple of sentences of this essay by Brian Doyle. Consider the hummingbird for a long moment. A hummingbird's heart beats ten times a second. A hummingbird's heart is the size of a pencil eraser. A hummingbird's heart is a lot of the hummingbird. Okay. So if students are reading that. I would ask them to, like a sports announcer does in a basketball game, talk about what the author is doing with each movement, right? So we might say, consider the hummingbird for a long moment. It might be like, oh, he's opening by telling me what to do, right? A hummingbird's heart is beats 10 times per second. A hummingbird's heart is the size of a pencil eraser. Oh, he's repeating himself. Like, you know, like really try to like think as though you're watching the writer make the writerly decisions and then try to announce what, what he's trying to do. So not so much what he just said about the hummingbird, but how is he setting up things he's saying. Um, the students have a, little, a lot of fun with this. And also, um, the other thing that happens is this last bullet point, which is they begin to develop their own language for what a text does. It does no good, I have found, um, for me to say to students like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a declarative, or you see how that's inverted there, or use, you know, use my language or the language of sort of um, <clears throat> grammar or structure, the way we talk about writing, to sort of get them to see it. What's better is if they describe it. So in one of my classes, for example, they would call that first consider the hummingbird for a long moment. Um, my students start calling that the bossy move, right? It's like when, when a writer tells you what to do, um, and they start calling it the bossy move. So I think that that really helps them 
right? Talk about writing is when they can do it through their own language. That's why it's so important for me. Talking about reading, they invent their own metaphors. They think about it through their own language, through the lens of like what makes sense for them. That's going to make the text more sort of accessible, right? And I do this when I even teach like parts of the essay. Like I don't let my students call it a thesis anymore. I don't, you know, like let's call it something else because the thesis has come to mean, at least for my students, this sentence in which they mention three things that they're going to talk about in the essay. You know, like that's what it's come to mean. Well, that meaning is not going to cut it in this sort of difficult, complex, you know, context. So um, let's call it something else. You know, um, give me some give me some ideas about what to call it, and students will also often come up with some pretty interesting things. Um, I've had students one semester come up with kind of like a body metaphor where the student was like, well, that's the heart of the essay. And at first I was like, oh, that's cheesy, you know, the heart. Like I was thinking, like, oh, that's kind of cheesy. But then my students started thinking about it in terms of like actual bodies. They were like, well, if the heart is the thesis, then like what's the veins, what's the arteries, you know, what's the cartilage, the bone, you know, thinking about, instead of thinking about linking sentences and, and topic sentences and transitions and all this language that I think falls empty to them a lot of the time. And honestly, falls empty to me a lot of the time, too. So um, I wanted to give a couple other examples of um, sort of teaching reading as rhetorical and um, to also think about um, ways of, I know sometimes like, you know, particularly if people are using tech book, textbooks, um, it's difficult to feel like, ah, oh, should I buy this textbook? You know, it's 60 bucks. And there's all these readings. I can't possibly use all of them. And one of the things I love to do whenever I use not just a textbook but any anthology um, is to think about how could I make use of all the pieces? Like, what could I do? So one thing I do with Ways of Reading is I have students go through and read the opening sentence or the opening two or three sentences to every piece so that we can talk about this idea of, like, what does it mean to begin? Like, how, how are, what are these different ways we could begin? Because students know some standards, like I could begin with a question, I could begin with a story, I could be, and I want to get, I want them to get more complex, more specific about like what that means. So we can even take a couple of these examples. Um, this Richard Miller example, right? And this is the beginning of um, um, of his piece, um, and it starts, though they may already have faded from memory, driven off by more recent and yet more spect spectacular horrors. For a few short weeks in 1999, the events at Columbine High School mesmerized the nation. So I have my students talk about, like, how could that a sentence could have been? Um, actually, I just taught this essay a couple weeks ago, and one of my students used the word suspension. That He thought this was a suspension opening. And I was like, wow, what do you mean by that? And he's like, well, you know, you don't really get to the what you're talking about to the end, and the, the, there's all these commas that keep suspending you in space, right? And I was like, yeah, that's super smart, and that's way better than, like, there's a lot of commas, you know, like the sentence, but this idea of suspension, because that's exactly what's happening in that opening. So what what would it mean to use an opening sentence that suspends, you know, and have students try that. Like, you try to write a sentence that suspends or an opening that suspends, and not suspense in the, like, create suspense, but, like, in the sentence structurally, you know, like, what does it mean to create a kind of suspense there? Um, my students were calling this um, – um, uh, Richard Rodriguez opening because it started with I. They called it the me first opening, right? Like I'm going to talk about me first as a way to get into this subject. So these are ways for students to really think about like what does it what does it mean for a writer to make decisions about how we're going to begin. Um, another thing I, I I really like to do is um you'll see a, a link at the bottom of the screen here, and I think they'll share the all the links I use with you at the end here. Um, but if you're familiar with the show Radio Lab. That's great for teaching students like how to recognize movements in essays because they're really good at doing it like in podcasts and, and media and stuff. Students will, and that episode on animal minds is just amazing because it's, it's it's exploring the question of do animals feel or how do animals feel, but it starts uh, in a church, and you're like, what are we doing in this church? And then you start hearing these barking dogs, and then you realize that where you are is that um, you're in this place where all these people have brought their pets to church um, to get them blessed so that they'll go to heaven. Um, and then that sort of transitions right into this subject of, um, you know, do animals have feelings, have spirits, have spiritual, you know, containment or a uh, really interesting piece. So that, you know, really helping them see, like, people make decisions about movements and that those de decisions are complicated. And one way you can read a complicated text is, you know, worrying Temporarily, maybe not worrying about what it says, and instead worrying about what it does as a way of getting at what it says. Um, so I think that can be really helpful um, in engaging students in those ways. So um, I wanted to give a kind of example of um, something that um, I have students do in class that kind of extends um, 
this work. And I think this class activity can be um, super productive in that in that sense. Um, so I read to you a little bit from the um, from the Brian Doyle essay. Um, uh, it's called uh, uh, Joyous Volodoris, and it's um, some of you might be familiar with it because I think it's been anthologized, but it was originally an American scholar. So it's just a two-page essay where he talks about hummingbirds and blue whales and their hearts and sort of seems very scientific even for a while. And then at a certain point, you realize that this is a reflection on you know the human condition, on human nature, and those sorts of things. And so one of the things I do with students is try to get them to identify you know, when it feels like that and to get them to see that when it feels like that, when it feels like it's about human beings and not just about hummingbirds, what he does to make it feel like that, right? Because he makes choices that make it feel like that. It's not just it starts to feel like that sort of on its own, right? If I just sat here and talk about hummingbirds for a half an hour, um, you might not think it has anything to do with you. So what kind of moves does he make um, to make it feel like it has something to do with, with us as we're reading? So I read you that opening sentence, can, uh, consider the hummingbird for a long moment. Then he's got later in the essay, he's talking about how um, basically we're all made of water. And so he has this line, we all churn inside, right? Which of course is this kind of collective address, right? And like this happens to all of us. Um, and then he also does this direct address move, right? Calling the reader you. Um, here's an example of the sentence at the end. You can brick up your heart as stout and tight and hard and cold and impregnable as you possibly can, and down it comes in an instant, right? So these are three things that in the essay, you know, um, students can notice about like, oh, so this is why it makes a difference. If you're just, you can indirectly address a reader, you can include them in your we. Otherwise, if they don't see it in a text, it doesn't do as much good for us to circle we on their papers and say, who are you talking about? Which I know, like, I do just all the time, right? Like, who is this we? Who are you including here? Um, but really getting them to see, like, how does the we work? How does the you work? How does it work when we don't say we or you when I, when I is in its place, right? Really thinking about how those words work um, to, do, to do certain kinds of intellectual work in an essay. So... Um, I'll help students, you know, notice these things and then um, do this exercise with them that I think is uh, really illuminating. Um, so I'll have them rewrite um, the sentences you just saw uh, without addressing the reader at all. So I'll go back for a moment. Like if we take we all churn inside, they would take that sentence and rewrite it as like many people churn inside. Okay. And we talked about like we we would talk about the differences um, between saying we all churn inside and many people churn inside, um, not just uh, how it sounds because of course the second one definitely sounds more sort of I don't know boring less less believable, um, but also like what happens in that we we all churn inside even though the meaning of the sentence is essentially perhaps the same, um, uh, or I guess we'd have to say all people churn inside for it to be essentially the same. Um, so then, you know, we have a conversation about what those differences are. And then I ask them to sort of try it on something else. So uh, uh, I'll say, you know, get in pairs and together write a series of three sentences that are about today's weather. Uh, you can say anything you want with one rule. You have to address a reader in the ways described above. So, you know, they'd have to – here's some examples. Today's weather is hard on all of us. Right? This is uh, different than saying today's weather is bad. Um, you can try to plan your day all you want, but rain doesn't care about your plans, right? This is this direct address to the you, right? Um, of course, very different than um, many people hate rain or um, today's weather is bad or those sorts of things. So really kind of thinking about um, uh, how, how writing is constructed is a way of getting at what it is and what it's doing as opposed to trying to get right away at the meaning, um, which I think can sometimes be challenging pretty much in any uh, any essay, not just one I would consider sort of dense and difficult. Um, so um, I want to close with just a, a few points, and then hopefully we can uh, have a discussion. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to kind of go back over um, some of the things that um, either I explicitly kind of articulated here or I'm going to sort of explicitly articulate now in relationship to what I just shared. So... Um, Four things um, sort of come out to me as really essential in thinking about difficulty. One is this idea of reading closely and reading like a writer. So I don't just mean close reading in the kind of literary sense, but I mean you know what it means to sort of get in there with the sentences and what they do. And um, I think that's 
for me, it's been really huge with students um, in terms of them feeling empowered um, to make choices in their own writing, which often I don't think it feels to them like they're making choices at all. Um, it feels something. It feels more something that's automatic, and so sort of helping them see in their own writing that even in those automatic um, essays that they're writing, there are still these choices that they're making, and the choices impact what happens um, when other people read or engage with the text. Um, this collaboration with peers and instructors. So I know I mentioned early on that you know the first time I taught um, uh, Foucault um, that I, I was probably like the best time, and it was because. I was the idea that we were doing it together was really real in a way that now that I've read, you know, the Foucault Police from, from Ways of Reading like 25 times, um, there's no, there I can't make it feel like that because there are things now that I understand about the text that I wouldn't have as a 24 year old in an MFA program trying to um, teach composition for the first time. Especially for me, I'd come from a, actually a small liberal arts college where we didn't even have composition, so uh, uh, proper we had no composition courses. When so they said you're going to teach first year composition, I was like, great, what's that? So, I mean, I was really a, a sort of co-conspirator and co-collaborator with my students about, like, yeah, what are we going to do with this? Gosh, man, this is hard. Um, and I think any time I get the opportunity to have that be a real interaction, um, I think it's really important for students to be able to see that, you know, we can struggle through it together. And then, of course, having students, you know, as I shared that exercise at the end, collaborate with each other in terms of um, building building sentences, um, thinking about the effects of sentences, um, I think is really crucial. <clears throat> um, creating a culture of visible difficulty. Um, so this means, um, and perhaps people might want to talk more about this, um, is um, how can we make um, struggling something more visible in the classroom? I think the instinct is that when a student is struggling, or if we make a mistake or in our struggling, that we want to sort of get rid of that as quickly as possible because it could be embarrassing or someone could feel ashamed or, you know, that sort of that sort of setup. Um, but I think actually that creating a culture of visible difficulty means that like everyone's difficulty becomes visible to the room, right? And, and I don't mean errors. I mean like the struggle, the difficulty, and talking about how awesome that is as opposed to here we're identifying struggle and errors, but more thinking about here we're identifying struggle and it is like really important struggle, so let's pay attention to it. Um, and I think that's like a larger cultural problem as well. So, I mean, I think teaching students to do that is actually like crucial to like life and politics and like having a better world um, that we're all willing to sort of look at it, like look at what's hard, look at the difficulty instead of sort of trying to do this idea of like making it go away, right? Um, so I think that's a really um, hard thing to do. Um, and um, if people want to talk more about that, we can just in terms of like the culture of the classroom and how to how to make that more possible. Um, and then the last thing is um, I call making inquiry the prime primary activity, and that goes back to the idea that what's important about a text is the questions it raises um, for a reader, rather than always think about it in terms of argument. Um, um, I like to think about even the arguments raising questions um, as more the strategy, because um, I think. Even the word, you know, I talked earlier about students inventing their own languages. I even try to, like, come up with other words for arguments because argument seems to sig signal to my students, like, a linear step-by-step -step movement through a logical process of an opinion, right? And um, and most of my students, um, you know, uh, and this might be different for people teaching in, in different contexts, of course, but most of my students um, at the University of Nebraska, um, they can write an essay in which they give an opinion and then three examples of why they feel that way and then give the opinion again. Like, that's the essay they've been writing since since sixth grade. And so I think that, you know, um, it's it's time for them to kind of do something different and to sort of, you know, be looking at the world in more complex ways. Um, very few arguments actually work like that, <laughs> you know, where it's sort of that linear movement. Sometimes I like to draw <laughs> students on the board. Like, it's it's not a straight line. Like, there are loops. There are going back to things like it's a, more of a web, more of a mess. And I think, you know, acknowledging that and helping students think about, like, never mind what the primary argument is, or we can talk about that briefly, but then let's think about, like, what kinds of questions does this argument raise about, you know, culture, about race, about society, about any of the things that, you know, we're, we're often talking about in a first year writing classroom. So, um, so that, yeah, those are some, some strategies and ideas um, I wanted to share about the subject, and I, I look forward to any questions you want to ask or, or comments you want to make or things you want to talk about. Sure. Uh, one question. Uh, 
how do you broach the conversation of developing your own language in the classroom? Does it de develop work organically uh, between you and the students, or do you bring it up specifically uh, during a class intro? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I don't bring it up necessarily during the class intro, like, you know, when I'm sort of you know, going on the syllabus, that sort of thing. But basically, as soon as we start reading, I start asking students the kinds of questions um, that would invite them to invent um, language. So if they give me, for example, the uh, the stock language, then I might press them to say, like, call it something else, or or what's it like, or or if you were going to come up with a metaphor for an opening sentence, you know, what would it be? So often it's just by invitation, by inviting them to do that work. And when I hear, you know, something that like that my students saying the other day, that thing about suspension, right? Well, now that term is sort of circulated in our class as, as a word that we use, and we, know, we all know what we're talking about when that word circulates. So I think it is about the invitation rather than saying like, okay, class, today we're going to all invent our own language to talk about what an introduction does, you know, because my students, for example, have lots of like, oh, there's an opening sentence, there's a linking sentence, there's a thesis sentence, there's an example sentence, there's all these names of sentences. I didn't even sort of know about this until I started teaching uh, composition. Like, I didn't know that these, I, I guess I went to the different schools, but I didn't I didn't know about these, uh, you know, I knew about thesis statements, but I didn't know, like, every sentence in the introduction, you know, had a name. And so looking at all different introductions and saying, well, all those kinds of things aren't even in, like, if we read the introduction to all of these essays, we don't see those things. Um, we see other things. So let's, if we were going to name these things we saw, what would we name them? Um, rather than saying, like, okay, I want you to invent your own language, do it. No, it's more actually trying to have an organic conversation and then seeing what, seeing what kind of language develops and how you can make it work with them together. You know, I gave that example of one student saying the thesis was like a heart. I had another experience where um, a student called the thesis the current, like in an ocean, like, like the current. And uh, I was like, wow and then the other students started talking about like this like so what's the sand and how it sort of how the shoreline gets like worked on by the current right like and i was like oh my gosh this is amazing so i mean they're so they're so innovative um if you just invite them to be rather than say like we're going to come up with names now because then i think they're like oh there's something i'm supposed to be doing right as opposed to just like let's just look at this text and like what what would you call doing that you know what would you you know so like even in the the consider the hummingbird for a long moment, uh, my students started calling that the bossy uh, sentence. But it's not really. I mean, it's very soft in this essay. Consider the hummingbird for a long moment, right? It's it's not like think about the hummingbird, which is different. But still, they ca started calling that the bossy. And then when we sort of developed the conversation, I would say sometimes, what kind of boss is this? So the sentence is bossy, but what kind of boss is it? Is kind of boss that's like, go get my co barks at you and says, go get my coffee? Or is it the kind of boss that's like, hey, listen, I, I really need you to do this, right? <laughs> and I think, like, whatever language they provide, it'll have its possibilities if you just sort of stay open to what they are. Great. Uh, regarding the uh, creating a culture of visible difficulty, yes. is there a way to do this? So that stu students still see you as an instructor rather than a peer. Yeah, and I should first say that um, you know I'm aware as I'm talking here that we all, each one of us, each teacher um, in the whole world right now, is uh, has their own set of sort of uh, relationships to authority that have to do with student perceptions and have to do with gender and race and. Um, I would even say, like, in my case, for example, you know, depth of voice. I mean, the fact that I have this, like, sort of big kind of this New York accent and this sort of big, manly kind of voice, you know, that, that so, so I want to acknowledge first before I kind of even talk about the answer to the question that all of our relationships to authority are, like, complex and different. And so there are things that certain instructors can do that others cannot do, um, which I'm, you know, um, I'm called to sort of look at again and again because I think there are ways that um, because of my own sort of like masculinity, I get to sort of take care, take advantage of some sort of male privilege in the classroom even though I'm not a man. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, everyone has that kind of different relationship. So I want to say that first in terms of thinking about authority, but also um, is I think – it, it, it a little bit, this is kind of a, an emotional answer, I guess, but it a little bit has to do with really being honest with yourself about the anxiety of authority, um, about like what's my context, what am I anxious is actually going to happen if my difficulty or my failures become visible. 
Um, you know, what does it feel like? Like if a student finds a typo on the syllabus, you know, what does that feel like to you? Um, and because that's going to be your first answer. So like if the typo is found and you're the mortified instructor, then there's like something for you to look at there in terms of like what's, you know, what's going on with me to like a typo. I mean, I don't get like that about my students' papers. I don't like circle typos and drop their letters, grades by a whole letter because of the typo, right? You know, it's like I'm, sometimes I don't even notice them or circle them, right? Because like these types of things are not a big deal. And so how do we make that um, that idea that like the, these mistakes or, or or whatever we want to call them or errors or misreadings or failures are like not a big deal and they're just part of um, actually one of the new essays in, in ways of reading uh, by Catherine Schultz is from a book called Being Wrong, and uh, I think it's a it's a great essay to work on with students because it is about this whole culture of like that being wrong is supposedly this like horrible thing, yet we do it like all the time. <laughs> like we're all wrong all the time. Um, we change our minds, we're wrong so much of the time. So I think like working with students to to sort of be like, okay, like we're all sort of wrong all the time. Um, and, that there's a, and, that, and that sort of being open, that that doesn't actually make you feel like your authority is in question. But of course, if it already does, then there's like something else you know, to be worked out, I think, for the instructor themselves. Um, and it took a lot of practice for me, like it really did. And it started from the very first time I taught when I was trying to decide whether I was going to tell my students that it was the very first time I had ever taught um, uh, a class like this in my entire life. And that I and, and should I tell them that I've never even taken a composition class and now I'm their composition instructor and I'm just like some 24-year-old poet, like I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so, I mean, I think, and I did, I made the decision to, to tell them, you know, like this is the situation we're in together and to explain to them like how writing programs work and how graduate students get funding and like, you know, that I wanted to be good at it, but it was my first time doing it. And, and again, I'm not sure, I'm not sure everyone would be comfortable in that instance, but I've tried to cultivate and practice that I think since the moment I started teaching, which I, I taught high school a little bit before I taught college, but, um, but I really started practicing practicing that kind of vulnerable moment because I think most of the time what you'll see is that uh, good productive things happen as opposed to all the things we're afraid of happening. You know, the coup, the, oh, you're wrong. Okay, well, then my grade is wrong. You know, like, um, and that's, which is to say you're not going to have students who are difficult, but I feel like those students are going to be difficult whether or not you're wrong or not. And I mean, you're wrong even if you're not wrong. So, I, you know, I just think it's a, you know, I, like I said, I think that's kind of an emotional answer, but I, I think that's probably the truth of it. Thank you. Uh, let's see, another question. How do you capture that first time I read Foucault feeling in your classroom? Do you refresh, refresh your readings from class to class? Do you commit to trying something new every semester? Yeah, I do. Um, I teach, uh, I, well, I should say also, I teach first year writing uh, once a year. Um, and uh, I mostly insist on that. I think I'm probably the only faculty uh, here at the moment who like insists that I will teach that first year writing course every year. Um, a, that's where a lot of my interest and research interests are, but also because I love teaching first year writing. And yes, whenever I do it, um, I I try not to, um, sometimes I even, if I can manage it, now of course this is all time management stuff and again, you know, acknowledging that we're all in different positions and contexts. For example, my son was born uh, nearly two years ago now, and I've done a lot less new assignments since he's been born. <laughs> um, but I do try to challenge myself to always do one new text, even if it's short, and sort of one new assignment that I feel like I don't know anything about the text yet, you know, and I try to do that one first, meaning like that's the first experience we have together is that experience with that new text, um, as opposed to like, oh, it's the new one, so let me do all the stuff I know first, and then I'll, you know, so, so that's one way. Um, and the other way is to sometimes what I do is um, is I'll take if I'm if I'm teaching for example the section from panopticism in, in ways of reading is I'll go um, I'll go find some you know I have a lot of Foucault books on my shelf but like anyone else I don't think I've read them all cover to cover and so sometimes what I'll do is I'll just open you know a book by Foucault or a book by Kierkegaard or whatever and I'll before I go to teach like I'll just sit down and just like open it and just read like four paragraphs and just like really try to get in the space of like yeah what's that like that's horrible. It's hard. It's like really hard. And how did I learn to see what the payoff is? Because when experience is alienating, we don't want to do it again. I mean, that's normally how we respond. Like, wow, that's really alienating. I would like to never do that again. And, you know, those kinds of texts um, can be alienating. And some texts are alienating not because they're difficult because they're dense, but because they're difficult because the content is difficult or students don't want to acknowledge 
things politically maybe that are going on, and so that can be a challenge. But I always try to remind myself, and in the same way, like if I'm teaching a, a, a text about, you know, race or white privilege, and I know students are going to struggle with it, you know, I really try to, sometimes I pull out blogs of, like, people that have complete opposite political convictions of me and, like, have the experience. Like, what what is the value of that experience beyond, you know, being like, I am reaffirmed in all of my positions? Um, I think that's really crucial. So for me, it's about like practice and it's about getting in that space, but it's also about, yeah, new texts, a lot of new texts, um, a lot of texts I don't like, the texts that I find hard to read. Um, I really like to work with those kinds of, you know, those kinds of texts. Um, when I say don't like them, I don't mean like this is a horribly written piece and I agree with nothing of it, but I mean more that like that was not pleasurable, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I think that could be uh, an interesting experience too. And I think if we want to, a culture of people who find um, struggle and sort of intellectual thought valuable. And I think there's a real backlash right now, this idea that, like, you know, being an intellectual is somehow, like, uh, useless or people should not want to do that or, it's it, you know, people critique it as though it's bad. Um, I think, you know, like, the first year writing classroom is one of the places for us to illuminate to students. Like, no, actually – you know, thinking about the world in these kinds of ways can actually make a lot of things, not just your own life but and your own writing, but make a lot of things better. And so I think for me that, that project is kind of, you know, at the heart of why I teach writing to begin with. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any more questions right now. Um Again, if anyone has more, please put them in the Q&A. Yep. Hey, Jillian, it's Joy. Um, yes. I want to thank everybody for the, for the great questions and Daisy for the really thoughtful responses. Um, I think we're just about uh, to an hour here. So if you have any uh, final questions, as Jillian said, please send them along. Stacey, do we have one more slide? Uh... There we go. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I, I just want to mention uh, to everybody on the call uh, that, again, uh, Stacey is the editor along with uh, David Bartholomew and Anthony Petrosky of Ways of Reading. We've been referencing the text periodically throughout today's call. And uh, that is available if you don't even have an exam copy of the 10th edition. It's available through our website uh, on the Macmillan uh, Higher Ed catalog page. So you can always go there and find it. You can also ask your local representative. Uh, and then uh, Stacey has kindly provided her email address here, so you'll see it uh, on the final slide. And if you want to reach out directly to ask questions, we welcome uh, that kind of engagement. And on our community site, which I'll ask Jillian, if you don't mind, to post that link one more time to the community Absolutely. site, we've got a great resource for all of you on the call uh, in terms of everything from assignment swaps to all of the webinar recordings we did this fall, including uh, the one that you just participated in. If you wanted to share it with colleagues, you're welcome to do that. Uh, it's free to register for the site, and then you can also download several of our professional resources. So another great place to get content uh, from the folks here at Bedford. And there's the community link. If you look down in the uh, chat window, you'll see Jillian has posted it. You can go there and register. So Stacy, we usually uh, give the final thought to uh, our presenters. So if there are no further questions, and Jillian, maybe you can confirm that for us, we'll go over to Stacey. Uh, all I Any have is from, from DH, uh, who just says, thank you for the great presentation. Well, that's very kind. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for signing up. And um, and I really, um, you know, I know my email address is there, and people might still be hesitant to use it, but I encourage you to use it. Um, I love to, uh, and I sincerely mean this, um, I love to talk about teaching. <laughs> uh, I love to email about teaching. I love to, anytime anyone wants to talk about teaching, just, uh, you know, send me, shoot me an email. Um, happy to talk with you. Happy to share resources. Um, you know, any of the uh, assignments are, are the, I can't remember, um, um, Joy and Jillian, are the slides av available too? Uh, a recording of the presentation will be available on Macmillan Community. Okay. Uh, we can send out that link afterward. Okay, great. Or I can send out the page where the video will be available. Great. Excellent. So yeah, and if there's anything else I, I can do to, to, to help folks or um, talk with you about um, the subject or about ways of reading, I'm happy to do it any time. Um, I do a lot of uh, visiting colleges and things. love to do those things as well. So thanks so much, everyone, for, for being here. Thank you very much, Stacey. 
Everybody have a great day. We appreciate your participation today and I look forward to being in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you.